good evening. Um, I'm just going to read the web announcement um, for this meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee on the 27th of June. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet or filmed and will be capable of repeated viewing or another use by third parties. If you are seated in the lower public seating area, then it is, <clears throat> it is likely that the recording cameras will ca capture your image and this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. This may infringe your human rights, sorry, human and dead protection rights. And if you wish to avoid this, then you should move to the upper public gallery. Could I please also remind members to activate their microphones before speaking? Um, this is the first meeting of this municipal year, and as item two on the agenda details, under Article 11, paragraphs 13 to 17 of the Constitution, the chairman and vice chairman of the committee shall be appointed at the first meeting of the municipal year for the term of one year. Both councillors and co-opted members serving on the committee are eligible for appointment to either role. However, if the chairman is a councillor, then the vice chairman must be a co-opted member and vice versa. The chairman and vice chairman from the previous municipal year are eligible for reappointment. So I'd like to seek nominations for the chair, please. Yes, I nominate Councillor Peter Bolton. Is there a seconder? I would second that and nominate Councillor Peter Bolton. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Well, we could vote on that if you like, but as there are no other nominations, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hand over Councillor Bolton if you want to take your seat. Yes. <coughs> Can I seek uh, nominations as vice chair from co opted members? Is there one co-opted member? <laughs> yes. How can we nominate? Yeah, can I nominate Mr. Jarvis? No, I second that. Thank you. to item three, apologies for absence. There are no apologies for absence. Thank you. Declarations of interest. No, thank you. Uh, to um, confirm the minutes of the meeting held in March of this year, uh, there only one other thing, one thing I've bring up on this was the progress of the external audit. Um, perhaps if I could invite Andrew to address that, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, as, as, as members of the audit committee who served uh, last year will know, we've had, um, not just us actually, uh, probably the whole of the local government sector have had problems getting final accounts approved. Uh, there have been tremendous delays in, in the external audit sector, uh, particularly driven by a, a lack of um, qualified audit staff. So we're all struggling a bit to try and get our, our accounts completed at this moment in time. And, and as it stands, as of today, we're still waiting for our accounts for 2021 to be audited and signed off. Uh, and we will very shortly, uh, by the end of this month, publish 21-22 as well, which will also need to be audited. We have been working with the uh, Public Sector Auditor Appointments Body, uh, which is an arm of the Local Government Association, uh, and with the partner uh, at our firm of auditors, who are Deloitte, uh, to try and resolve the issue. We reached an agreement whereby uh, Deloitte will audit 2021 and then 21 22's accounts back to back, and they are due to start on site next month. 
So we're expecting them. They have been in contact. Uh, and we hope they will come forward and complete the audit that they started previously and then move on to 21, 22. And that should bring us back up to date, hopefully. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? Thank you, and, and do we accept the minutes as they stand, uh, the record of the previous meeting, which those were not there, but accepted, thank you. Matters arising, I don't believe there are any. We, would, we could now go on to uh, item seven which is to uh, note the work program on pages 9 to 10, um, itemised. Are there any comments to be made about this program, and, or do we accept this as the program is set out? Yeah, thank you. Uh, moving on to, uh, sorry, the annual report of the Chief Internal Auditor, I ask Sarah to present. She is going to be busy this evening, but if uh, she could present the, this agenda item, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, I'll take you through the report. As, as a reminder, this is a really important uh, report. It feeds into the annual governance statement, which you will see later on in the agenda. And it's my opinion of the control environment, the risk management environment, and the governance environment at the council. And I do this objectively and independently. So I've not put on any pressure by senior management to come to my conclusion. Um, so if I start on the box on page 12, that's, that's the highest opinion that I, ca I can give uh, where I say everything is adequate and effective. I, I can't say anything more exciting than that, but that's, that's the highest uh, rating that I can give. The rest of the report is just um, backs up how I come to that opinion. So if I take you to the table on the top of page 14. <coughs> so this sets out the work that we've done over the, um, uh, over the year. So... Uh, it's really good news is that there were no limited uh, assurance reports. Um, the majority well, have been substantial and moderate. So that's, that's a really good indication to begin with. Um, there's other things that back up my opinion, not just the audits that we do. So we have the tracker process, and you'll see that in the progress report. And again, this is a really important uh, part of the internal audit process because it's no good us making recommendations if they're not actually implemented. And the recommendation tracker will show you anything that's overdue or any high recommendations so that you can focus on the key ones. What it doesn't show you is all the good work that's done in the background to actually clear off recommendations so you don't have to see them. Moving on down that page then, there's other forms of assurance. Um, so we get involved in special investigations. Um, we didn't have anything that was of particular note for last year. We, we give lots of advice uh, and we sit on a lot of groups and have our input on that as well. Things like corporate governance group, risk management group, information governance group, you name it, we're there uh, giving uh, our our advice there. Moving on then, uh, effectiveness. So it's important that uh, your internal audit function complies with the public sector internal audit standards. And we had a, a external assessment that's required every five, five years and then we came out squeaky clean with that. We also have some performance indicators to make sure that uh, we're on track with everything and they're on the page 15 and 16. So I, I've we did enough internal audit work, even though some audits were deferred, uh, for me to be able to give my opinion. Um, and also that um, we've been working with management to make sure that we have effective engagement. And we have a 10-day working day for management responses, and that did slightly creep over, because we've had a couple of more complex reports that we wanted to get done. Um, 
and it was important that we had managements buy into those recommendations. It's no good us recommending something and they, they won't implement it or half-heartedly implement it. So it's making sure that we have appropriate and proportionate recommendations. Uh, Appendix A, I don't intend to go through. That gives you a list of everything that we've done. You've been getting progress reports throughout the year. And then what's called Appendix 1 should be Appendix B is, is just the list of the audits. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from... Yeah. Councillor Allen. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairman. On the tracker pro, uh, process, um, are you happy with when you put a recommendation that it's done in a timely manner? Um, do any end up outstanding and what happens if they end up outstanding or people are unwilling to put them in place? That's uh, a really good point and that's the whole point of the tracker is that anything that is overdue comes to your attention and then when they um, do a revised implementation date I keep the original one and then I cross it through so that you can see whether things are taking a long time um, to get done. Often there's good reasons or good business reasons why something hasn't been done and we will challenge people uh, when, they, when we first make the recommendation, we challenge their um, implementation date there to make sure it is they can achieve that. And then we will challenge them through the tracker process. And the tracker process does go through the exec team so that if we're not getting any traction, they will help us. Um, and then at that point, when you see them on the tracker and you think, well, things are just taking too long, then you've got um, um, the right then to bring officers to account. But at the moment, the tracker as it stands is, is only eight. You've only got eight on there, and none of them are of particular concern to me. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the top of page 14, there is a table, which is the table of assurance ratings. <clears throat> and there are other things in this report to see how assurance is built up. But of course for members, the assurance ratings is one of the ways we can have confidence in the activities of the council. And if we look at the history of this, back in 1819, there were sort of 25 investigations, uh, if I can call them that, that's how they started off, I suppose. And that's dropped to a much lower number now. Um, and therefore, you know, on the face of it, the council doesn't have such a wide spread of assurances that otherwise it would have had in previous years. Now, I guess there may have been some pretty exceptional circumstances in the period, but could you just sort of clarify that, please? Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, over the years, I've... Uh, done more of a focus around doing, uh, giving advice and more what I call consultancy type work. So if I see a problem within the council, rather than do an audit and tell officers exactly what they already know, I, I think, well, let's fix it. Let's get the right officers together and let's have a look at it. So a recent example is conflicts of interest. We know that the process isn't as robust as it could be, so we could spend you know, 10, 12 days looking at that, make some recommendations and tell officers to get on with it. Rather than that, I've um, sent my team along to talk to uh, HR and sort of say, why isn't this process working? What can we do to get it done? I d I'm not responsible for implementing things. I'm just a facilitator. So there's a lot more of that. Um, and especially when we had COVID in those two years, we were giving a lot more advice. Can I, just, can I just double check, is there, a, is there a staffing numbers issue here or is it, is it more majority of it, the points you've made? Um, no, there's not a problem with staffing numbers or resources, it's just trying to find people who, who are accountable and making sure that they do what they're meant to do or help them facilitate. <laughs> Fine, so we can now move on to the uh, governance, annual governance statement, please. Again, Sarah. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Do you want me to take this one, Andrew? Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just scrolling through my uh, papers. A bit there. Right, uh, as I said, the annual governance statement is a really important document. It goes with the statement of accounts and it shows how we're accountable to the, the public. The external auditors will look at it in detail and make sure that their understanding of the council uh, is reflected within our annual governance statement. Um, so the majority of the annual governance statement just sets out what the governance framework looks like and um, without going into too much detail, and it's got things in there like the audit committee and complaints and the procedure and things like that. So in section three, we actually uh, review the effectiveness of that and we tend to do that through the corporate governance group which, um, and then uh, the exec team and uh, we feel that the governance framework has been effective throughout the year. There is some, um, we're still making reference to COVID because last year COVID was still quite prevalent um, and luckily they, it didn't, hadn't impacted on our governance framework and it didn't, hadn't the previous year, but although we were doing more work remotely, but staff are now coming in and we're holding our council meetings in person. So um, on table one on page 46, there are the governance issues, well, not even issues, of things that we should be aware of or keep an eye on uh, previously. And uh, in, the, in the columns there, it's what we've actually done to address that. Um, and then on table two, which I think is the important part, is what are the governance issues for this year? Uh, that we should be keeping an eye on. So the first one there is the economic issue. So we're in a very volatile situation at the moment and we just need to keep an eye on, on that and react to it as, as we uh, go along. Uh, number two is about the statement of accounts and the section 151 officer has also uh, explained where we are with that. So it's about working with our external auditors to get those signed off. The financial management code review uh, we were hoping to do last year, but we were, um, the finance team uh, didn't have the time to do that because they were concentrating on their restructure. And then we have these things called service assurance statements where we ask the assistant directors to do a self-assessment of governance within their particular areas and, that, and we pick out anything, are there any themes there? And the themes there this year is around business continuity to, to make sure that we can cope if we, not that hopefully we have another COVID, but if something more drastic happens, you know, we, we lose all our IT or a service area doesn't, isn't available. Um, so there is a council-wide project to look at that. We, we have business continuity in place, but we just need to refresh it and make sure it's up to date. And the review of financial regulations, um, it's always important to make sure they're up to date and we just need to make sure that that is on our timetable to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions uh, um, on this presentation? Yes, C C Councillor Heap, did it? Uh, yes, it's, um, yes it's a sort of an ongoing issue. I know what um, Sarah will say, that it's all been done and looked into, but it is about the performance of the planning department, um, given the, the recent refusal for uh, the appeal for next. Uh, we do need to have an idea of how much money was spent by the council on trying to promote that because it was promoted by the officers and that we actually were told that uh, all the officers supported it so we need to have a look at um, how the planning department is working in those terms because they've got it catastrophically wrong at all levels at this point Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I admire uh, Councillor Heap for his in-depth analysis of uh, the inspector's uh, decision on the next application, which clearly shows that the Council did not get it catastrophically wrong across all aspects. Uh, there is only one uh, case where one, one reason for refusal that has been upheld, and that was on a balanced decision on terms of the bulk in and its impact on the green belt. Um, 
So I don't think it's got it catastrophically wrong. Um, as Councillor Heap, I'm sure, knows, we do have, on a regular basis, coming to each planning committee a report on appeal performance, and clearly next will form one of those. Uh, it is a big item. Uh, so I don't think it's fair to say that the planning department got it significantly wrong. I also would take significant exception to uh, his statement that the planning department was promoting the de uh, development. They had analysed it in their professional opinion and felt that it met policy. That is not the same as promotion. I know Council Heap does, on t uh, from time to time, have difficulties in understanding uh, what the planning department is actually doing and has, on a number of occasions, raised particular issues, some of which have, uh, val are valid and some which, which aren't. Um, as Council Heap will also have noticed, uh, the leader as part of the activity at full council actually separated the planning department into two place, two different sections to be looked after by, two, after by two separate portfolio holders, one of which is specifically targeted at looking at the development management process and trying to improve it. Uh, I think that's a good way to deal with this. Um, it's not a case of looking at one or two individual planning applications which people have different views on um, and saying that's a example of things not working. So I, th I think it is valid. We do have particularly places that look at the planning part, at the planning process in terms of scrutiny panels. Uh, we do have the chairs of, and vice chairs of the development management committees. I think this is looked at in great detail. As I say, we do now have a por new portfolio holder looking at the development management process. I think it'd be useful to give him time to see what he thinks of the situation and how he might come forward with a report on what needs to be done. Could I come back? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I take on board what um, Councillor Philip has said, and um, obviously there are some kind of uh, steps to analyse what they're doing, but uh, a lot of people are being affected by this on a very personal level, and it is to do with the performance of the planning department. And when anybody asks a question, if they ask it six times, they're declared a vexatious correspondent or a vexatious resident, and then uh, we will not respond to you, is what the, the council responds to them. So it's not great at the moment, and we do need to be better at it, because this is ultimately about fairness. Fairness for the individual, fairness for each developer that comes into the district. So it's not, it's not a really happy picture, and I understand what Councillor Phillips has said, but it's not a brilliant picture, and we could do better. Chairman, if I could just come back yes, to um, uh, cor correct yeah. that misstatement, um, which I'm sure Councillor Heap didn't actually mean, uh, simply because a person asks uh, a question and then comes out and asks another question, they wouldn't be deemed a vexatious uh, correspondent. That is something that the Council does on very rare occasions. And that tends to be where either excessive amounts of communication take place or a simple question is repeated and the answer is ignored. Those are the cases where vexatious complainants are identified. Uh, and as I say, there are very few of them uh, in the council. And they don't all happen, it has to be said, in the, in the planning department. I'm aware of some other situations where people have been deemed to be vexatious. Um, and it tends to be because they will not take the answers that they're given and they just come back and answer the same question. In the end, the council, as any council is, is responsible uh, under the local government ombudsman. And frequently what happens is the ombudsman will find for the council and the complainant will carry on asking the same question again. It's often after that sort of stage that they might be deemed to be a vexatious complainant. Uh, I wouldn't like it to be thought by people watching the webcast that if you want to ask questions of the planning department, you'll be called vexatious. It's if you keep asking the same question and ignore the answer. I'm sorry, I have to come back on that one. Because even in just a small area, Buckers Till East, I could put, or Buckers Till certainly, I could give you half a dozen examples of people who've asked a question and not been given an answer. There's one in Russell Road, as we all know, because we've read all the emails, where the ICO has said that the freedom of information should be provided to the resident and it's not come. And the answer has not arrived. Do emails exist? Do they not exist? It's a simple question. 
But the fact it's never answered, and then he's a vexatious complainant, means that we don't get to the, result, the, the foot of the problem. So it's not simple blandishments like Councillor Philip was saying, that's, you know, you don't accept the answer. There is no answer. If I can just come back again one more time, Chairman, I don't think this is one that you want to spend much more time on in your committee, but I think a reasonable person listening to what Councillor Heap had said, you might assume that there are six or more vexatious complainants in Bucketsdale. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that there are not six or more residents in Bucketsdale deemed to be vexatious complainants. For individual cases, I suggest that the Audit and Governance Committee is not the place to discuss that. If I can address to um, Councillor Philip, it does appear to be out of our remit, perhaps, but where is the forum for a debate if it's to be held um, following uh, Councillor Heap's remarks? Uh, I would if he wished to re redirect these questions, where would it be directed? Is there a specific committee, one of the select committees, or whether you feel it's been addressed? Indeed, I think that in terms of overall planning, the uh, Stronger Place Committee is probably the one that looks after uh, planning. I think that would be a good place for that one to be. Um, in terms of individual, uh, individual residents, I know that Councillor Heap has had a fairly lengthy session uh, with the service director and planning manager around this particular complaint that he was talking about. So that one, I think, is covered. And if you're talking about individual individuals, I would uh, strongly suggest that a committee is not the right place to be doing it, and that's one that gets handled uh, through meetings with the responsible officers. And as I say, Council Heap, I know, has had a meeting with uh, the service director. Thank you. Um, if we can move on, Councillor Lyon. You, you wanted to yeah thank committee. you very much Tim um, it, it's a, a question really for Sarah because um, we, we have changed um, the look and feel of the council with a lot of people working from home or working remotely I'm just wondering how that has affected the audit program and looking forward what changes we need to make to uh, ensure that our assurance is robust across the organization um, from department to department. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lyon. So when we first went into lockdown, uh, along with everybody else, we were working totally remotely and um, it did stall our audit programme for a little while. Uh, and then there were other things that we had to concentrate on, like the COVID grants. Um, in some ways, it's actually been helpful, people working remotely, because we can actually get hold of them <laughs> easier, because we can just set up a Teams meeting uh, and talk to them. And we've sort of um, found different ways of looking at data or evidence, so people can sort of take a photograph and then send that to us, or they can show us on the screen and looking at things like that. So uh, the amount of assurance we've been able to give has been fine. Um, as we've come back into the office, um, it's been good because we can meet um, officers face to face and also you get that sort of what they call the water cooler chat where you sort of find out where things are going on and we can sort of give our informal advice um, that way. So it actually hasn't stopped us working, it's just we've worked in a different way. Mm. Can, can I come back on that one then, Chairman? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm more concerned with the operational processes between departments rather than the actual uh, ability for the audit team to actually meet people. Um, because people are no longer working in the building on a day-to-day -day basis, communication between departments now relies much more on process than the water cooler moment. Um, so how robust... Our, are our processes between departments for making sure that we have a, an end-to-end -end assurance on day-to-day -day processes. So we'll just come back and give you an example. So we did the leisure management contract. Um, so we were having meetings 
as part of our audit with officers and we were also talking to the leisure providers as well and we could see through our testing and our evidence that, they, that both sides were talking to each other and we were making sure that it was working for both sides and we could um, we could see that through our talking to people so I can't see that those relationships have deteriorated because of COVID. Excellent okay thank you very much. I invite Andrew to answer or comment. Thank you, Chair. I suppose I'd just add, really, uh, that we have been sensitive, I suppose, to the impact potentially of COVID in terms of uh, how we work uh, as, as an effective organisation. So one of the things I think we've done in response to that is actually put more effort into making sure that we, we, we cross work across departments. We have regular face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, cross-organisation meetings now for leadership teams at different levels to make sure we come together and discuss issues. I think um, probably part of the construct of the building prior to the, to the building programme here was we had departments that were, were in their own areas, um, siloed to an extent, I suppose, and actually not didn't work perhaps particularly effectively across the organisation. But I think actually uh, COVID's been an opportunity for us to actually think about you know, the barriers to coming together within the organisation and to find solutions that, that mean we, we now work more effectively. Teams is a tool, for example, that now everybody is familiar with, but wasn't widely used prior to COVID. Actually, it's been great in many respects in terms of allowing us to bring multiple t people together at the same time for, 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 for different meetings. So I think it's you know, there are challenges as a result of, of COVID and, and staff now working in a hybrid fashion, but also it's created opportunities as well. I think what we need to do as a management team is to continue to identify where the you know where it's not working as well as perhaps it should do and put extra effort into making sure that those gaps are closed and that we are as effective as we can be as an organization and i think we're achieving that Good job. thank you any other questions to this item on the agenda thank you we can now move on to item 10 which is the corporate forward strategy, which is on the supplementary uh, agenda. If uh, so thank you, Chair. I'm going to hand this over to um, Martin Crow, who's my corporate forward manager. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if it's okay with the committee, um, would it be okay to do 11 first? and then 10, because they flow a little bit better from one into the other, if we do them that way. That's um, fine, yeah. <laughs> um, for, for those that are new to, to the committee, um, every uh, year the Corporate Fraud team produce a, uh, an annual summary, which is a, which is a report just detailing um, the kind of work that we've looked at in the, uh, in the previous year. And if I refer you, as I say, to, to item 11 first, which is the, the corporate full team annual summary. Um, I know we've mentioned the, the COVID word uh, again. Um, hopefully this will be the last time that one of these, uh, one of these reports has a preface uh, that mentions COVID. Um, it, uh, it did affect the corporate full team in a lot of its... Um, operations um, not so much uh, as the year before but subsequently we were getting back on track and then um, around about November December we had the Omicron um, situation which kind of set us back a little bit but uh, uh, you know as, as mentioned we have found um, different ways of um, doing the work that, that needs to be done which we, which we are taking forward as a as a matter of course anyway um, as I say so hopefully that's the last time we will we will put in a, a COVID related preface to to that um, I won't go through every single um, item on the on the report just um, some areas of interest obviously you can see there um, there's a, uh, a, a chart really that um, uh, that gives us a brief synopsis of the kind of uh, 
uh, investigations that we've opened and closed during um, April last year to March this year, um, and a, uh, a little summary of our success rates. Um, about 37% of the cases that we looked at last year um, were closed is fraud proven in some way or another. Um, as usual, for, as I say, for those that are uh, uh, familiar with the uh, with these reports, um, we've had continued success with our 100% vetting of the right to buy applications. So this, or last year, I should say, um, a total of 39 applications were received by the home ownership team. Um, and 18 of those have been stopped or withdrawn as a result of the, uh, the vetting processes that the, the team put in place. Um, the only one where we didn't particularly get involved was it was um, seen quite early on that the uh, applicant lived in a property that was ineligible for the right to buy scheme. So that's the only, only one of all of those 39 that, uh, that we didn't get involved with in some way or another. Um, moving on, tenancy fraud. Um, we've had some successes in the last year with regards to tenancy fraud. Um, tenancy successions, um, we took seven, undertook seven investigations um, into tenancy successions. For those that are unfamiliar with that, it's where um, a, a tenant um, passes away and um, somebody applies to succeed the tenancy from the, from the tenant. Um, three of those were found to be fraudulent in some aspect. One particular one of note, uh, that upon their death, um, we discovered that the tenant was actually living in Norfolk and had been um, for quite a number of years. Um, and when we traced, traced it back, we found that the property that they, were, that they were living in, or supposed to be living in, was actually obtained by mutual exchange during the time that they were living in Norfolk. So the whole process was, was fraudulent in, in some regard. Um, so uh, that, was, uh, that was discovered, and uh, I believe with, in terms of uh, that particular case, legal action is pending. Um, we had some cases of illegal subletting. Uh, again, the report notes a, a couple of ones of, of interest where we've, uh, very similar in some ways, where we had a tenant that had moved out of her property um, about 12 years ago, and an investigation subsequently discovered um, that the tenant has living, had been living with her partner firstly in Dorset, then in Milton Keynes and then subsequently in Northamptonshire where they, now, where they now own a property. Officer was dispatched up to um, sunny Northamptonshire where they found the, uh, the tenant living in the new property. Um, they were interviewed formally under caution and the tenant surrendered, formally surrendered their tenancy and handed their keys back. Um, again, another similar one, a bit closer to home, um, is where a tenant had uh, moved into another property in Onga. Um, and continue to sublet uh, their council tenancy to a member of their, their family. Um, that's, sub uh, that's subject to um, uh, legal intervention, at, at which point we're trying to recover the property um, from, the, uh, from the family member. Okay, um, other work of the corporate fraud team within the, the year. Um, quite significantly, we, um, we had a project to replace our quite aged um, fraud information management system. Um, the current software had been, a, in various grades, had been around for the last 20 years. Um, so we took a, a project to actually completely renew it. Um, and the new system went online about a year ago, about this time last year, and um, subsequently it's been fully tested um, and uh, seems to be working very, very well and is good at, actually good value for money as well, which helps. Um, so that's about, that's about it for the, in terms of the uh, summary, in terms of, of, of last year. Um, I'll take any questions on the summary before going into the, uh, the team plan for, for this coming year, or if anybody has any questions, I can take them all at the end. Quite happy to, either way. Thank you. Councillor Owen, yes, please. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's actually related kind of to this one and to the other item, um, but I noticed on the other one you had a Noah cheat in your street uh, section. But on this one, have you thought about offering a reward to the public when they uh, know that fraud has been committed and they report it? Because I was thinking if you, you, know, if you save the council one and a half million to actually incentivise people to come forward might be uh, an interesting thing. Uh, yes, um, the knowing, as you may all be aware, the Noah Cheat in Your Street um, publicity campaign um, is still ongoing. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting point you raise. Um, a few years ago, um, we did actually consider um, the possibility of, a, of an incentive scheme for, for people um, to report frauds. Um, at that time, it was deemed that it, uh, that, that that wouldn't go forward. Um, because uh, it was felt that it was uh, it was fundamentally wrong to incentivise people to, um, to to do their public duty, for want of a better phrase. Um, however, having said that, I mean obviously we're all aware of the good work that Crime Stoppers do, so that is something certainly that we would be open to um, discussing uh, at, at some level. Thank you. Any other um, questions at this part of the agenda? And then move on to the other next item, please. Okay, thank you. This is related. Yep, so this is uh, obviously now item 10 rather than 11, and uh, it's the, uh, the, the forward plan for the corporate fraud team's uh, work plan for the, uh, the forthcoming year. Um, for anybody who's uh, familiar with these, it doesn't deviate a huge amount from the ones that we uh, that we normally uh, bring to to the committee. Um, just a few things of, of note um, that I wanted to um, just touch upon. Um, as mentioned previously, because of the high success rate with the um, the right to buy um, applications, as we normally do, we will continue going into this year with a hundred percent vetting rate of the uh, of the right to buy applications. Um, something slightly different for this year, we are actually embarking upon a program of data analysis exercises in conjunction with our, our colleagues in internal audit. I think we've, uh, we may have mentioned these in previous reports using the, the phrase fraud it. Um, but we've, um, we've had one of the uh, corporate fraud investigation officers undertaken a number of training courses um, regarding data analysis in order to assist with this project and the view is we're going to undertake these on a regular basis during the forthcoming year and we'll focus on or try to focus on areas of potential fraud that may not have been looked at previously elsewhere. Um, we're looking at um, a, a culture of um, innovation when we come to, to data analysis and uh, out of the box thinking. Um, and uh, we've already started work on our first project, um, which is focusing on procurement and the, uh, any suspected fraudulent activity within the, the council procurement process. Um, moving on, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we undertook some community engagement, which was quite successful last year. We um, we. Uh, we had a guest slot, I suppose you'd call it, in one of the webcasts uh, that would uh, that are um, arranged by Housing Services, uh, which was uh, which was very very successful. In which um, we gave uh, a talk on uh, social housing tenancy fraud, which I believe was very well received. Um, and as we um, as we spoke about earlier, the Noah Cheat in Your Street advertising campaign is set to continue. However, we're always looking at, at different ways to kind of refresh this campaign and look at new uh, uh, new ways of, um, of, as I say, freshening it up and keeping the campaign relevant. Um, that's proactive work with, with re reactive work. Again, very um, uh, exactly the same as, as every other year. We will review and risk 100% of the referrals that we receive um, in order to f uh, ensure they're allocated efficiently and the, the highest risk referrals are dealt with as a matter of priority 
um, and uh, efficiency. Um, we continue to um, engage in the National Fraud Initiative exercise, which is uh, ongoing. And for this coming year, we've, um, we've hopefully got an exciting opportunity in terms of joint working with one of our um, neighbouring councils, uh, Harlow, where we've been engaged to take on the vetting of their right to buy applications in the same way that, that we do ours. Um, that's going to be provided on a paid for uh, basis. And the hope there is that will um, lead to a, um, a more wider uh, formal uh, shared service with Harlow going forward. And that would be um, that would be taken on and that would be implemented as soon as is practicable. Sorry, again, if anyone has any questions, I'd be too glad to answer them. Yes, Councillor Owen, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah. Apology. I did read the um, report, but I didn't pick up on that point about um, Harlow. How, how would that work in terms of um, charging them? Is the council going to make a profit from this, and how is it going to be worked out and that sort of stuff? The, um, the right to buy, um, we've worked out the average time that it takes our own officers to deal with our, one of our own right to buyers, and that's including the interviewing process and possibly the visiting process. Um, and for the right to buyers uh, with Harlow at the moment, we're going to charge a fixed fee, um, which um, reflects the, uh, the officer's time and the resources that are, that are put into it. Anything that goes beyond the, um, the hours set for that fixed fee would then be charged uh, at an hourly basis. Yes. Hmm. Could, could I ask what that fee is, sorry? I guess that's my question. Um, I haven't got that to hand at the moment. I can, um, I can certainly get that, but I, I haven't got that. But I, I think the question reading between the lines is also, is it to make profit or is it just to cover costs? Right. Yeah. So the idea is, is to make a little bit of uh, profit, but it's about helping the wider community and, and focusing and helping our council. So there is a built-in extra profit, but that's not the main aim. Jim, and I'd, I'd, also, I'd also say that the idea of working with shared services is actually to make money for the council to make, 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 a, make a profit. The, the scale of profit depends on uh, what, how much demand is. I would prefer not in a public forum to be talking about prices that we're going to charge because that would give other people the ability to simply undercut us. But if, if it's something that Council Owen wants, I'm sure uh, the officer will get back to him uh, offline. Also, the relationship with the county council, it implies here that there can be cross-charging, but I understand that, that in practical terms that is not a big issue. Is that correct? For the count yeah, the, county? Yeah, the amount of work that we do with the county council is, is minimal. It's mainly for Epping and then our part of councils nearby. Sorry, if we can close that part of the agenda, and thank you for that clear presentation. It's, it's um, interesting reading. Um, you, you say you've, you've done the sort of tell on the neighbour type thing, and it's been successful, but have there been many people reporting neighbours? It, it implies it's successful, but are people doing it? Yes, it, it's a difficult one to gauge um, because um, a lot of the um, referrals that we receive either through the fraud hotline or via the, the website are anonymous. So nobody, you know, and they're not obliged to, is to leave their, their details. Um, so it's difficult to gauge where somebody has made that referral because they may have seen a, a leaflet that has come in with their council tax bill or they may have seen something online. Um, but certainly, yes, we do receive um, quite regularly 
from what we can only assume are residents um, of the district where uh, referrals re will refer to sort of people within their neighbourhoods and their, their roads and streets and, and blocks of flats, that kind of thing. So it is being successful in practical terms rather than just theory. Thank you very much. Sharing where it stays on, sorry. Chan, you can leave that microphone. Oh, I can leave this one. Thank you. Right. I'll try not to use it too much. Um, if we can move on to, um, sorry, uh, item 12, which is again to be presented by Sarah on the annual report. Thank you. Um, Chair, so in line with SIPFA guidance, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and whatever they use. <laughs> see. Sorry. Um, so in line with good practice, it, it recommends that audit committees produce an annual report of the work that they've done throughout the year so that uh, key stakeholders and residents can see the work of the audit committee. I don't intend going through it in any detail because uh, it sort of speaks for itself, but I think it's a really good reminder of the range of topics that you, as an audit committee, look at. Um, things you're looking at good governance, the annual governance statement, external audit, internal audit, risk management, anti fraud, and treasury management. And as a reminder to people on the audit committee, um, you don't have to be an accountant to be on the audit committee, you just need an inquiring and challenging mind. Um, and that's what the report sets out and just shows you all the good work that you've done. And then we just want that to go to full council to ratify that. Um, and well done. I think you're a good audit committee. Thank you um, for placing that trust in, including the new members. Um, we will try to live up to that. Thank you. A any comments from... Uh, members of the committee or visitors, thank you. No? you. You need to approve that to be referred to full council, that report. Okay, so we approve this uh, report to be referred to full council. Thank you. Yes, that's unanimous. Thank you. Now move on to the internal audit progress report, which will initially reported by Sarah and then... Uh, thank you, Chair. So I'm going to hand this over to my senior internal auditor, Sue Lindsay, because she's closer to the detail than I am. Thank you. So for new members, this report is presented to each meeting to give an update on the work of internal audit uh, since the previous meeting. Um, so since uh, we last reported in March, we've issued four uh, final reports, uh, one substantial assurance and three moderate. The council house building um, audit was an initial review looking at the oversight and management processes of the council house building program. And this year we will do a more detailed review of individual um, housing developments. Um, I think it's worth noting that there were several improvements from the previous uh, audit and no recommendations were made um, following this audit. The uh, second one is the leisure management contract which was awarded moderate assurance. Um, we found there was good oversight of the contract and robust verification um, of the support payments uh, during COVID. Um, and it's been agreed to um, keep the open book reconciliations going forward, even though the council is now receiving um, income um, on the contract. Um, notes and actions of the monthly contract meetings are now kept and uh, work on the risks is underway. Uh, the Treasury Management Audit, also moderate assurance, found that the Treasury Management Strategy includes all the elements required by the latest code of practice 
Um, but there's a need to have an operational risk register to provide more detail um, of the risks and the mitigations included in the strategy, and this work's ongoing. Um, also, the cash flow forecasting spreadsheet, um, which was inherited by the finance team, is now being worked on um, as a priority to make sure this is, is robust going forward. The, the last one is the IT major incident management strategy, also moderate assurance. The uh, strategy follows good practice and a documented manual process was implemented during the audit. Um, a proposal to increase retention periods of backups is going to be taken to the um, information governance group as well. So moving on to the recommendation tracker. So following um, completion of each audit, any, all the recommendations are added to our internal audit tracker so we can monitor these and make sure that they're implemented. So um, this report uh, provides uh, any which are overdue and um, a high priority, whether overdue or not. So I think it's pleasing to see we're getting a, a steady decline in the overdue recommendations and uh, no high priority ones. The, um, there are three gas safety check um, recommendations still on the tracker, but I think it uh, should be noted that gas safety checks are being carried out and the recommendations relate more to updating policies and procedures. And actually, they've been further delayed. They need to be revisited um, now that the service is transferred um, to Qualis. And the last part um, of the report details some of the other work that internal audit undertakes. And um, I'll just pull out a couple of them. It's uh, the risk management working group is um, working hard on um, the risk management framework and revamping the risk register, uh, which will come to this committee once this work's completed. And the energy rebates. So we have a process in place now for awarding the um, government's energy rebates. Uh, letters have been sent to those customers who don't pay by direct debit with a link to an online form. These are merged into a template and the bank verification checks are performed by internal audit using the government's spotlight tool. So I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Let me see. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, page 75 refers to the Treasury Management um, Audit where moderate assurance was given. Um, but we haven't got a Treasury Management report here, and I'm struggling a bit to grasp what the issues could have been. So, so rather than do it now, I was wondering whether it would be possible to do some highlighting the next Treasury Management report comes forward to show where the moderate problems, moderate assurance issues have risen and how they've been resolved. Would that be acceptable? So you want that as part of one of the Treasury management reports? I think it would make more to... sense, and I'm, I'm yeah. struggling a bit to understand yeah. what the points are here, so yeah. that would make more sense to me anyway. Okay, yep, I'll take that back to finance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the members of the committee, etc.? Thank you. Move on now to item, item 14, um, which is to be presented by Andrew Small. Uh, please, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this is a standing item on the agenda that you'll, you will have seen before if you're an existing member of the committee. And it brings to the Audit and Governance Committee's attention that the significant financial risks that the are facing the organisation at any point in time, or at least risks to the government's framework anyway. Um, 
These are highlighted on the second page of the report, uh, and it highlights the, 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 so the, the nine main risks facing the organisation and indicates how their risk rating has changed from the last meeting to this one. So there have been a couple of movements uh, this time round, um, both largely due to the same issue, I would say. So the first one actually is an increase in demand for financial and housing assistance, previously welfare reform, uh, and that is now increased from C2 to B2. And the reason for that is the, the, fuel, the emerging fuel poverty crisis. So risks facing the economy generally and for those um, on lower incomes and the impact that that will have in terms of their ability to uh, afford housing uh, at its base level. So we are worried about the impact that, that inflation, and particularly energy inflation, will have on people's ability to um, get the, the, the housing um, assistance they need and, and to remain in, in remain in housing. And following on from that is the council's own financial resilience index, which is uh, number three on the table. That was, uh, I would say that was C1 last time, and it has actually elevated now to B1. And the reason is exactly the same. It's because of the general inflationary risks that we are seeing in the economy at this moment in time. Not just about energy inflation, of course, but fuel, um, fuel costs and the risk that it will translate into higher wage demands and then for higher pay costs as well. The council is, council's budget is sensitive to those. Um, our income streams are, are largely fixed, um, so we are vulnerable to rising costs. So I think this is a, a watching brief area right now, uh, but I think we'll be talking about it much more in fu future meetings of audit and governance. And I think it is a rising or an ele elevating risk at this moment in time. Thank you. Chair. Any comments from the committee or yes? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I appreciate that inflation is probably a major issue, but um, I'm a bit concerned about uh, the risks of interest rate rises, not only the current ones, but the potential for future ones. And there was a time when the Forest Council had low borrowings and it didn't have a structured company partnership with a, a third party. Um, the situation is different now. There's more, the borrowings of the council are higher and there's a relationship with the operating company which involves interest rates in some way. Um, so perhaps it's not necessarily the time to raise it as a major issue here, but perhaps there are issues there that need to be drawn out somewhere for the, for the committee. Yes, Mr Small. No, it's, it's a fair point, really, and what I should have mentioned in the, in the previous, in, in my introduction to the item, really. So it is, it is one of the risks. There are, there are other um, economic pressure risks, risks as well, such as building inflation as well, for example, is another risk that we are aware of at this moment in time and, and, and watching closely. Uh, borrowing costs, yes, the council is, uh, has, has considerable um, um, debt. I would say for most of it historic, of course, and therefore mostly on fixed borrowing. So anything that we've taken at this moment in time has a fixed interest rate on it and a low interest rate as well, generally, unless it goes back um, 15, 20 years or more. Uh, but it does represent a risk, of course, for any new borrowing that we need to take. Uh, and there is new borrowing in the capital programme, uh, and therefore we will need to keep an eye on that. We might, you know, if, if it's associated with business cases, we will need to reassess these business cases to make sure that they still stack up. Um, but, I mean, for a whole a risk, sorry, a whole range of reasons, the, the, the economic position is much more volatile than it has been for, for many, many years. And it's not I'm telling you something you don't know. I think everybody's aware of this right now. Uh, and it, as I say, will become a, a, a constant um, element of discussion, I think, not just within this forum, but probably at Cabinet and Council in terms of wider conversations about budgetary pressures as well. So it's going to be, as I say, a dominant conversation for the next few months, potentially years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just add a couple of things to what Andrew was saying. One of the biggest areas, one of the two probably biggest areas for our borrowing 
uh, our, the housing revenue account and uh, our support for Qualys. Uh, housing revenue account has a 30 year business plan which is going to be revisited and reviewed each year. Uh, clearly as uh, interest rates affect that, that will change what can and cannot be done and therefore what the priorities in that uh, housing revenue account are. So I think we've got a degree of uh, confidence around that being uh, successfully handled. Uh, in terms of our borrowing to uh, onward fund Qualys, uh, all our loans to Qualys have a margin over the Public Works Loan Board and we're already in discussion with Qualys that as PWLB rates change, uh, that will obviously impact uh, the rate at which we can actually offer uh, loans to Qualys. So we, we are covered, I think, on, on, the two, on the two main areas. Uh, hopefully that will give Mr Jarvis some confidence that we, we, we are looking at it. But inflation is without a doubt uh, an issue, um, as are the interest rates. And uh, Mr Small and I discuss them on a regular basis. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Owen, thank you. Uh, two questions, actually, if it's OK. Um, one coming back on Councillor Phillips' point, then. So can you just clarify, the Qualis borrowings from us are fixed rate, and it sounds like our borrowings are also at fixed rate. Is that correct on the first question? Uh, for absolute detail, I will obviously revert to Mr Small, but uh, the fixed rate borrowing that we do for Qualys, it then has a margin added to it, and that is also at a fixed rate. We have some loans uh, in terms of the, the loan profile that we go to Qualys, where um, while they are younger in their life, shall we say, they're at a higher level because they're obviously a higher risk, and as the company matures and they get more collateral, we're able to bring those rates down. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, so there are some loans that we're still negotiating with Qualys at this moment in time, and, and we will take into account the movements in the interest rate market on, in relation to those. Loans that have already been agreed and paid, of course, are, are at fixed rates from both parties for our borrowing is fixed and, and our rates to Qualys are fixed. Thank you, that, that's Thank clear. You. And then my second question was actually on, um, there's no, nothing in here, I guess it's under business continuity, um, but, you know, I've seen services disrupted recently. I guess the one I'm talking about is like bins. Um, do you think due to um, potential headcount reasons or whatever it is that we should be raising that one as well if it impacts services? Thank you. I think it's an emerging risk, actually, and I think it probably is one that may become more of a, a, a risk that appears on the risk register in time. I think it's, I think all of the reasons, or most of the reasons associated with that are probably economic risks still, uh, and all, you know, they all feature in that overall umbrella risk of uh, financial uncertainty in the economy. But uh, when it starts translating into um, impacts upon service delivery, then, then some of those might need to appear as individual services. So I think it's probably a risk, yes, that will, will appear. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Any other business? No other business, Chair. Exclusion of public and press? <coughs> no exclusion of public and press. Thank you. Can I close this meeting? Get my watch if I eight minutes past eight. And thank you for your time. Thank you.